I'd like to welcome you all to this public health meeting regarding the perfluorinated compounds okay, and the uh, former Wordsmith uh, Air Force Base. I'm Dr. Eden Wells. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and I uh, really uh, appreciate you all having us here to be able to talk to you along with our partners. Thank you all very, very much for coming to attend this night's nice meeting. I'm thinking a number of you may have been at the open house earlier this afternoon to have some questions answered and certainly will have that capability this evening. Tonight our focus will be on providing you with the information about these chemicals. These were found in drinking water wells near the base, as uh, some of you who are residents here uh, may have received information on. We, the Department of Health and Human Services, along with District Health Department Number 2, uh, with your health officer here at our side, have advised the residents in this impacted area using these drinking water wells to use an alternative water source for drinking and for food preparation. This is a precaution given the many unknowns about the movement of the groundwater contamination off of the former Wordsworth Air Force Base. There's also a lot unknown about the toxicity of these chemicals. Tonight you'll hear the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality provide an overview of this groundwater contamination and their regulatory actions. Michigan Department of Health and Human Services will provide a, um, uh, information about the public health evaluation in terms of potential health impacts. A discussion of filtration options will be provided and there will be an update by the U.S. Air Force representative. We have a great facilitator with us this evening. Uh, I'm going to turn this meeting over now to Sue Menenti, who will facilitate the rest of the meeting, and then there will be ample opportunity for everybody to have their questions addressed. Thank you again for having us. Thank you, Dr. Wells. I just have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. There are restrooms through the back door where it says two sanctuaries. Just wanted you to know about that. And I want you to know that we will stay as long as you would like us to stay. So there is plenty of time for you to ask questions and provide comments to us. Also, there are a couple of us that are going to wander around with cards and can use these to take notes. You can use them to write down questions you would like to answer if you don't feel comfortable posing a question. Or if you would like to leave a question or a comment for us, for us to take back with us, Put a box on the end of the table and you can feel free to pop that question or comment in the box. All right, so here we go. I want to make a few introductions before we get started. We have with us Senator Jim Stamas. We have Representative Peter Vitalia. And from Congressman Dan Kildee's office, we have Jake Bennett. Thank you. And are there any other legislators or aides that I have missed? Thank you. I would also like to invite any local officials in the audience to stand and introduce yourself. Uh, we have um, several 
oral presentations for you tonight. There is time after each presentation to ask a few questions. And we did save a good amount of time after all of the presentations for a question and answer session. So um, again, we will have plenty of time to listen to your comments and have, uh, have you get answers to your questions. So first, I would like to introduce Uh, Dale, who is giving the presentation for the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, you have Bob Delaney on your agenda, and Bob is just a bit under the weather. I'm oh, sorry, what? Oh. <laughs> Dale, please. Well, I'm Dale Corsi, and I'm a consultant for the DEQ, and because Bob's voice left him today, um, I'm doing this presentation for him. We're going to talk about the uh, contamination we've sampled so far to date. Not every well in, in that hatched area has been sampled because residents are gone for the winter, but we plan on getting all of them uh, by early summer. Just a picture of a fire here because that's what these compounds were used for at the base, primarily. A little history, perfluoro perfluoral alkyl uh, chemicals, PFCs, a lot easier to say, were invented in the late 30s by 3M. They're extremely useful chemicals with great properties. They repel water, they repel oil, they're nearly indestructible, uh, they're soluble in water. All of these great qualities are also part of why they're a problem today. Uh, familiar products include Scotchgard, Teflon, Stainmaster, um, there are over 3,000 PFCs in commerce today, and we're talking today about only 19 of them. And by far, they're the most effective material for putting out fuel fires. There's no reliable replacement. And the three minute rule is, um, if a plane crashed, you had three minutes to get to the fire and start putting it out to be able to save the the pilot and crew. This is uh, Wordsmith, Air Force, Wordsmith Air Force Base, and this is the old fire training area. They used this with uh, PFC firefighting foams for 20 to 25 years, and uh, when we first started looking for them, this is where we started, because this goes down to Clark's Marsh. We have very high concentrations there, and it eventually resulted in the Do Not Eat Fish Advisory and some of the uh, other issues on base. <clears throat> uh, just to give you an idea on how PFCs contaminate groundwater and fish, using the firefighting, uh, fire training area as an example, you have the fire training area here. They started a fire where the guys practiced putting it out, and those chemicals were washed into the soil by the um, combination of the, the chemicals in the foam and the water, which then made it to the uh, groundwater, and that groundwater would progress down gradient until it got to the marshes. Uh, some pretty high concentrations here. Um, ended up in the water, in the sediments, in the, the ponds. <clears throat> the fish would eat um, the critters that lived in the mud and the smaller fish and so on. Um, other animals would also be uh, eating from the, <clears throat> from the uh, um, water area. So there's a, they've been contaminated to pretty high concentrations here, as high as, uh, I forget the highest one, but it's something close to 10 parts per million in the fish fillet. The current extent of contamination as we know it today, um, we started testing 
the environment at Wordsmith in 2010, primarily at the fire training area. Uh, after seeing how high, it was, how high the concentrations were there, we started stepping out and looking at other places where we knew, in particular, firefighting foams were used, and then eventually to a number of places on the base. So far, we've sampled approximately 200 wells, including the residential drinking water wells. Um, we've also tested the surface water, sediments, soils, fish, tree swallows, and muskrats. And again, coming back to uh, Wordsmith, the base, and the area of concern tonight. This is a map that shows approximate uh, locations of PFC plumes in the groundwater at Wordsmith. Uh, it's not complete, uh, but this is what we know so far. You can see <clears throat> at the fire training area, the dark color here indicates very high concentrations, uh, similar to here. And as you look at the legend here, you can see that out in this area, it's primarily in the lake, it's primarily low concentrations, less than 50 uh, parts per trillion. Uh, but we do have an area, whoops, we do have an area here in the lake that's a little bit higher. Um, groundwater flows is divide, groundwater flow is divided on the base. Part of it goes down to the Asaba River, and the other part goes out to um, Van Etten Lake and Van Etten Creek. Eventually, all of it ends up in Lake Huron. Uh, currently, um, there are a number of treatment systems on the base for other chemicals that uh, we've known about the contamination. And those wells are doing a fairly good job of containing it from spreading any further at high concentrations. So we've got purge wells here, and you can see that it's fairly hot here, but down gradient, it's reduced. Uh, same thing up in this area, we're, we're maintaining fairly low concentrations going off base. The exception to that is in this area. However, the Air Force just in the last year installed and uh, is operating a treatment system for the fire training area, which uh, I think it's only been running for, what, eight months now or seven months, something like that. So it's going to take a while before we see any improvement going down gradient from that. But that should cut off the majority of the contamination. It would be helpful if you'd stand off to the side because you blocked the presentation. I, I'm limited for the well, cameras. Maybe over this way. Okay. These kind of plumes are not isolated to uh, Michigan or Wordsmith. This is a, a plume that's, uh, I think it's about 100 square miles of plume in Minnesota. And Minnesota, Minnesota is So this is just an example of a plume in Minnesota. Uh, 3M is in Minnesota. They're one of the manufacturers of these products, and you can see they've got big problems there as well. Uh, to conclude, PFC, PFC contamination on and around the base is widespread. Um, over the years, because groundwater really moves fast out here, it has been able to spread quickly. Additional testing of the groundwater is necessary near the off-base residential wells, and the current on-base groundwater extraction wells and treatment systems are preventing it from um, moving off-base at high concentrations. <clears throat> 
Uh, the MDQ has submitted a letter to the Air Force basically saying that uh, quarterly testing of residential wells with PFCs are going to be, uh, we're requesting that. Uh, we're, we want them to expand the testing of groundwater near the residential wells to see if there's uh, high, greater or lower concentrations of gradient. And to install sentinel wells on the base to warn if highly contaminated uh, groundwater is, has the potential of moving toward the uh, residential drinking water wells. Um, we're also asking them to continue to operate the groundwater extraction systems to limit the migration of the contaminants and to provide a final remedy for the PFC contamination problems. What's next? The MDEQ and the Air Force will continue to test the residential uh, water wells. Additional testing for homeowners that were not home uh, when we first started sampling in December will um, continue this, this late spring and early summer. Uh, the cost of analysis for um, each well that we sample is between five and seven hundred dollars. So this is uh, 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 an expensive process. And if you have any questions, call Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob's coming up, I, I guess, here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dale. We have time for a couple of questions now. Feel free to ask it from your chair or come on up and use the microphone here. The question is who is paying the five to seven hundred dollars? Right now, um, either the Air Force or the state are uh, paying uh, for the sampling and for the investigation. So we, uh, we were asked to, to let you know this because a lot of people have been calling us about, you know, they want to sample or analyze their own well. And, uh, um, if it's not in this area or whatever, and so we want people to know this is what it costs if you're going to try and do it yourself. Yes. Uh, what about the areas that are outside this area that we have marked? There's so many other people that are going by that area have picked up some of these conditions that come from the PFC. I didn't quite catch the last of that. It's like you're not going, you're, you want to expand it some, but it needs to go a little bit further. Well, what, what we um, uh, are working to do, and um, when we understand that there's a potential problem in an area, we, we go sample it, and, and um, already from tonight and talking with people and analyzing some situations, we realize we've got to sample a few more areas. Um, your area is one of them, for instance, that looks like we should get out there and sample it um, because of the, the geologic conditions. I don't want to get too complicated, but... Uh, if we if we know there's a reason that it's reasonable that that this contamination could come from the Air Force base, then we or the Air Force will get out and sample that. Okay. Yes, sir. How how can you make that determination if it's from the Air Force base? If it's anywhere around Bennett Lake or any area, how do you know there's not a problem? Like on the North Shore or the East Shore, or you know, if you haven't tested those areas, how would you know? Oh, you mean from the base or, I mean, there could be contamination anywhere from these contaminants. I mean, one of the things that hasn't been explained is that they're found all over the whole globe. And I, I okay, all right, good. You have an area right. that you checked off from this point to this point. Right. What, what were the parameters that set that area? Okay. Why isn't it right. larger? Well, for one thing, we've done a lot of investigations out here in the first place, you know, because of the other older contamination. There's been literally, well, it's like 1,500 wells have been put in, surface water, all that stuff had been sampled in the past. We knew where the contamination, the old contamination had gone to. So we understood, okay, if you put some contamination at this point, it's gonna flow out here to this river. So we understood how the base was working. The new thing is that we found a new set of contaminants. And so, um, taking our knowledge of how the groundwater flows, how the surface water flows, we could tell where to look. And um, then we could tell like um, the Asalbo River. The Asalbo River is, is such a big river that it prevents water from flowing from one side of it to the other side in the groundwater. 
it just goes into the river. So if it's coming from the bay side, it stops at the river. And if it's coming from the other side, it stops at the river. So we know that if you drop some contamination on this side of the river, it's only going to go to the river. And if, if you look at the map, you'll see that that's where the boundary is that we're looking, because we know it can't get on the other side. Now, other things can get it on the other side, but not, not the normal, you know, how if you drop, if, if you contaminate the base, it's going to go to this point. So we know it's in the river, we follow the river, we can see that. Same thing happens up at Van Etten Lake. We don't expect it to get on the other side of the lake, except for maybe by the dam. So we're going to look at around the dam. Uh, so that's how we do it. And it's, a, it's part of the science. That, that's the part I like, actually, It's the science. So. I have two, two questions. One is, does the depth of the well affect whether or not the PFCs are in there? And then the second part is, it, you showed a map, and it goes along Van Etten Lake. And I wondered if you could put that map on there and show us the farthest north well that you've tested. OK. Uh, can I get your um, clicker? I mean, your um, laser printer? Later, uh, laser? Laser. Uh, oh, so the question was <coughs> that, um, yeah, so. the depth that the PFCs might be found at. And then also the northernmost border of the lake? Yeah, northernmost well that we sampled. More the northernmost well that we okay. sampled at the lake. Yeah, I wouldn't mind if you, you repeat all the questions for me, okay? So, yeah. save my voice. All right, the, the question about the farthest, farthest north well that we've sampled has been right here at this point. And this right here is Dry, dry Creek that's going from Seven Mile Swamp is right here. Dry Creek goes to Van Etten Lake. We sampled Dry Creek. It's also called Gray's Creek, I think. But we've sampled that. It has very low levels of PFCs in it. Um, very, very low. Uh, and anyway, the groundwater all flows towards the, this lake. It doesn't flow this way. And that swamp and that stream is marked sort of the northern boundary of where the, the groundwater on the base goes. Okay, so, so we know that it's not going to be beyond this area. That screen is very, very tiny. Ah, sorry, yeah. The screen? Oh, I know the stream is very, very, it is very small. Correct. Right. Right, right, and that's true. Um, but Van Etten Lake, the water in Van Etten Lake, as you know, is coming in from, is it the Pine, Pine River? Comes into the lake and then it comes out down here. So the current, all the current is going this way. And so what, what that means is that the groundwater will, well, it gets terribly technical and I'm a nerd and I will get way too technical on you people, so sorry about that. But anyway, the groundwater will discharge to this lake. It won't, won't try and get, go farther north. Um, this, this, uh, this swamp this swamp is acting as a barrier. What happens is water gets into the swamp and then it flows out away from the swamp in the groundwater. So this swamp, everything that's getting into the swamp up through here is flowing this way. Sorry, I wish I could make it simple. We geologists like to flay, wave our hands. Yeah. Oh, that's the other thing. That's a good point. We've got seven wells out in this area that are clean. There's no contamination, no PFC contamination in them. Well, there's no other contamination in them, period. So when you get up here where the water's coming from that's going onto the base, it's all clean. OK, one more question for Bob, and then we'll have plenty of time during the question and answer session for more sorry. questions to the DEQ. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Depth of the well. Okay, so that's if you pull down, you get that, and then that's really so you don't get any water from that, and the water doesn't get through that. So all the all the water that's under the base is from 60 foot down up to. Uh, up to about 10, 12 feet. So you've got, you've got maybe 50 foot of water 
where all the drinking water comes from and where any contamination went. And there's no other place to get water. So, and, and we know the contamination couldn't have gone below that. So that's, that, that's about what you're at. And so all your wells, everybody's wells, is in that <coughs> zone. Yes, sir. Um, are the resident deer in that swamp safe to eat? Are the resident deer in the swamp safe to eat? Well, I think, uh, I, I can't answer that. You know, I'm a geologist. Um, but we, the health department, when they get up here, you, you should ask that question again, OK? All right. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, we'll switch out the microphone here. Our next presentation will be given by Chris Bush, who is a toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services.